Um, now, this morning, we are going to be going back to a particular slide and repeating some points and um, adding on to things. So you'll see the same slide a number of times um, and we'll keep reviewing those points throughout. So just wanted to give you that preview ahead of time. And then uh, we don't have as much material to cover today as we normally do, uh, which you know is sort of surprising since it's another week on the person of Christ. But uh, this, I mean, we could go on and on. The, the entire class could be about the person of Christ and we'd barely scratch the surface. So Pastor Barker has limited to these two classes. Pastor Hathaway is going to um, add some things at the end that he... Uh, feels are good and helpful in this class, um, but there we may have some extra time at the end. This is my second to last class uh, teaching in front of you. Pastor Hathaway will pick up after that, so uh, you'll, you'll get a change in instruction here very shortly. Um, so last week, uh, we'll, we'll start with a review that last week we talked about the uh, divide in the scriptures between these two covenants. And we want to emphasize that so often we, it's particularly today, uh, modern evangelicals or, or even modern secularists will look at the Bible and look at the person of God as they think he's portrayed in the Old Testament. And they look at the law that God gives mercifully to his people and, and uh, the sacrifices that were required. We're gonna talk a lot about sacrifice today. Um, the uh, civic systems that were put in place for God's people and they think, wow, this was an angry, mean God who required blood sacrifice and he is no better than the other gods in the ancient Near East at the time. And then they look at the New Testament and they say, oh, okay, we got happy, lovey-dovey Jesus and, you know, this is, this is better. We might not still agree with this, but this is definitely uh, a God we'd prefer serving. And what, what I want to emphasize in our review today is not to look at Scripture in that way. It's the easier way of looking it, at it. We would argue that it's the wrong way of looking at it, that... Uh, the, that that split, we would still argue that God is not the angry, mean, horrible God that, that pagans want to paint him to be, but that split is more accurately placed in Genesis 3.15, where Adam beforehand in the garden were told that they had to obey perfectly. Adam had to obey perfectly. He could not eat of this one tree, and that responsibility was placed before him every moment of every day. He had to live in this constant state of making the right choice. He had to obey perfectly. But as I mentioned last week, the, the, we need to view Scripture as this grand story of, of teaching us that we can't do this on our own. This is something that, we, uh, that somebody needs to do for us. We need a savior, we need a redeemer. That was part of God's plan baked in from the very beginning. Uh, it's not a bug, it's a feature, okay? Uh, we, uh, and, and so that was the intent from the beginning, that we are going to need to be rescued. So where Adam and Eve had to do everything perfectly, we referred to that as the covenant of works. After the fall, the savior is promised, who will come to do what we can't do for ourselves. So we had the covenant of works where it was all on man to obey perfectly. The new covenant is a covenant of grace where someone else is going to obey perfectly on our behalf. And then the rest of the Old Testament points forward to that person who's going to come and obey for us perfectly. Um, it, we talked about the imagery that, that God put into the society of his people to point them toward the Redeemer, the Savior, the Reconciler. And then we get to the New Testament where the eyewitnesses come forward and say, we saw him. This is the Messiah that was promised. This is the person who obeyed perfectly for us, who fulfilled that covenant for us and is our covenant head. That's the one that God promised back in Genesis 3.15. And we kind of gave you this timeline, this plan of redemption, that covenant of works 
uh, that was up to Adam between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 3-15, and then uh, the covenant of grace afterwards, which is all up to Christ, and that that's the plan. God was not surprised at this plan of redemption. He's baked it in. We can't do this ourselves. We need a Savior. He sends the Savior for us, and that was his plan from the beginning. And as we said, the, the foretelling of the Messiah uh, there, the Old Testament foretells the coming of the Messiah over and over and over again. And uh, the main point of this morning is that Christ, the Christ came to offer his life to redeem his people. And the first point is that the Christ came. He didn't suddenly appear at you know, the moment that he was needed. No, Jesus was in the beginning, fully God. He was already existing. And then from heaven, he came to earth. Jesus is the second person in the Trinity. I believe that's one of your blanks. Uh, and you can see it's underlined there, but it's a little bit different. So I'll, I'll circle it for you. He's the second person of the Trinity. He was in the beginning. He was with God. He was God. This is why um, you know, the, the verses of John's gospel are so important and why having a little bit of knowledge of, of Greek and the classical context is, is helpful here. So uh, the Greeks spent a lot of time talking and thinking. They did a lot of other things too, but you know, what we are, are most grateful for is the amount of talking and thinking that they did. And we read their philosophy today. And the Greeks uh, had a lot of great ideas that have influenced particularly Western society, but they were always coming up short on the answer. They asked a lot of great questions and proposed some really interesting solutions, but they would always come just short of the answer. And you read some of those Greek philosophers, and one of the questions or one of the solutions that they always pose is that we need something to come and organize all of the rest of life for us, okay? They believed that there were just these spheres of organization in our life. So kids, there's you, and then there's mom and dad. And in our context, over mom and dad are the church or the elders. Maybe we have, well, we're not gonna put the government in the same sphere, but you get the idea that I'm talking about, okay? There are sort of these spheres of authority. And the Greeks said, in order for all of these spheres to work, there's got to be something outside of them that makes sure that they all work together properly. They didn't know what it was. They knew it wasn't their gods because their gods were too much like them to make sure that we all functioned correctly. <laughs> okay? So they, they even knew that something had to be outside of that pantheon, and they called that the logos, the word, the thing that was going to, to order everything else in the cosmos. And that's the word that John uses in his gospel. In the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. John comes and says to the Greeks, this was what you were looking for. We've got it now. He's the one who's going to order everything else in your society and your life. And so this is really important. We're going to talk even more about the Trinity today. This is why a Trinitarian understanding of the Godhead is uh, so important. This is the second person of the Trinity, and he orders everything else in created order. And as we've said before, um, you know, the, the Godhead, the Trinity, this three persons in one is not something that we can logic out. We've got a lot of evidence for it in Scripture. We've, scripture points to it over and over again. Scripture speaks of these three people in one, but we don't have an equation for it. We don't have a logical proof for it. This is something that Scripture reveals to us, and we have to trust the Holy Spirit to give us the faith to believe. It is a mystery. And that's okay. We don't have to have all of the answers figured out. Um, but we know that, the Holy, that uh, there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three distinct persons in one God. And uh, the, we trust the Holy Spirit to, to give us the faith. 
This is something that is supernatural, right? Super meaning above or beyond. It's outside of the created order and therefore is going to be uh, almost impossible for us to understand. Maybe we can understand it on some kind of theoretical level, but it's not going to make se complete sense to us on this side of eternity because it is outside of nature. He, it has to be revealed to us in Scripture. Okay, so uh, this is the mystery of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, that there is only one divine essence and substance. Now, you'll hear this word substance used a lot, particularly in one of uh, the creeds, the Nicene Creed. We talk about uh, the three persons being the same in substance. Now, I want to pause here. I have some extra time today, so we're going to do a lot of Greek philosophy. Just go with me here. Um, uh, this is really important, too, because it, it still comes up today. The word substance is a hot issue today. Bet you didn't know it. It's a word that shows up in a bigger word, transubstantiation, which is a long-standing and current Catholic doctrine. Okay, so I want to take a second to set us up for those conversations later by explaining to you what we mean by substance. And the easiest way to do that is to close your eyes for just a second. Everybody close your eyes. I want you to all imagine a chair. Okay, now open your eyes. Think about what your chair looked like. I bet a lot of you are thinking about the chairs you're sitting in, and that kind of defeats my point. But I bet if I had you raise your hand and tell me about your chair, Esther, what does your chair look like in your head? My chair is a brown color with a padded seat, a blue padded seat. Oh, okay, brown with a blue padded seat. Very nice. Uh, Miss Rachel, what does your chair look like? Oh, a wing back comfy chair. Okay, Karis, what did your chair look like? A rocking chair, love it. Okay, so we have three different chairs. Are they all chairs? Do they look anything alike? Well, maybe they have a little bit in, you know, common in terms of looks, but they all share a chairness. Okay, that's a, a word you probably never thought you'd hear. They might have lots of different qualities. They might be different colors. They might have different elements to them. They might have different jobs. But at the end of the day, they're all chairs. They share a chairness. You can sit in them. They have support in some way, okay, to allow you to sit and relax. That's what the Greeks meant by substance, okay, that there is something's substance meant that you could have a lot of different ones, but they would all have a substance in kind. If we're talking about chairs, they would all have the same chairness about them, okay? And so when we talk about the substance of the Trinity, or if we're having a conversation with Roman Catholics, if we're talking about the substance of the elements, that's what we're gonna be thinking about. That's gonna be the context for that conversation. So. Remember, chairness, okay? That might be important later. So, uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they have one divine substance. Um, and uh, they, uh, each person has, uh, there are in one essence or substance, there are three persons. Each divine person has his own property uh, that's unique to that divine person, and they have complete intercommunication and fellowship. So these are the things that we believe about the Godhead, about the Trinity. And the very first heresies that we see in the early church are, uh, are about, specifically, the person and nature of Christ. And these are heresies that continue to affect us to, to this day. The most popular heresies 2,000 years ago are very much still around. Okay, so let's talk about more Greek. I don't expect you to remember these words, but I've put up a, a little <clears throat> picture uh, in the bottom left to help you remember. 
Um, this is Saint Nicholas of Myra. And uh, is this the same Nicol Saint, same Saint Nicholas who's associated with the legends of Christmas? Maybe, maybe not. There are, you know, there are lots of saints associated with church, uh, church history and tradition. But um, this particular Saint Nicholas was present at the Council of Nicaea in 325, where the heretic Arius was arguing that Jesus was not God. Okay, and so the uh, the church, as we've said many times, anytime they came up against a teaching that they just thought was not right, they held a council. And they said, they said, we need to decide on what scripture says and what the church believes. And the word that came out of that council is homoousios. And that's why it says ho, ho, homoousios. Get it? It's funny. You can get it on t-shirts. Um, Homoousios, meaning the same substance. Homo, same, ousios, meaning substance. But, of course, there are different forms of this word. How about uh, heterousios, meaning different substance. Okay, different substance. This is a, the position still held by Jehovah's Witnesses today, that Christ is a, a creation of God, that he is a different substance, from the Father. Um, this You could even argue, as some do, and I really like this argument, that Islam, in its argument that Christ is a prophet sent by God and not a member of the Trinity, is actually um, a Christian heresy that has lasted, again, lasted this long. Um, uh, so Jehovah's Witnesses and, and perhaps Muslims fit into that category. There's even... There's even, insert one little letter in this word, and it changes it, homoousios, a similar substance, that Christ is a similar substance with the Father. And this is, again, very uh, alive and well today. It's held by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or who we sometimes call the Mormons, that he is not a member of the Godhead, but that he is a God with God the Father. And that, of course, uh, com turns into a lot of other theories about what we are and what we will become. So these distinctions are subtle, but they make a lot of difference. Homo usios, the same substance, that's what we believe. Hetero usios, different substance. And homo usios, similar substance. Again, that's not on the test, but I, I just thought it would be really helpful for you to know. Okay, now we have uh, in Philippians, uh, Paul writes this really interesting passage. Here we go. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. Now, this is a, a passage that has caused some discussion, disagreement. What does it mean that he emptied himself, that he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped? Well, is this, uh, is this against homo usios? Is this saying that Christ is a, a different substance? Theolog uh, theologians uh, disagree. They discuss this. But no, we believe if we look at the whole of Scripture... The whole of Scripture argues that Christ must have been fully God and fully man to fulfill the covenant of grace. And so we look at this um, and we say Christ was fully God. He was fully man. He emptied some of his privilege. Okay, He, he came to earth, John MacArthur wrote, voluntarily submitting himself to the will of the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit submitting himself to the plan of redemption that the Trinity had, has had since time, uh, since eternity passed. So here, Paul is here reinforcing the idea that Christ was fully God and fully man. We call this, kids, any idea what the, the, the big doctrinal term for Christ being fully God and fully man at the same time is? It starts with an H. Anybody? Jude isn't here to call on. 
Pastor Hathaway, you want to help us? Hypostatic union? Yes, it's the hypostatic union, okay? Now, this is a, this is a difficult, what, what does this mean? For somebody to be fully God and fully man at the same time? What does that even mean? It blows our mind, right? And so people try to come up with explanations of this that complicate it. I want to suggest to you that the simplest explanation is the one that we should trust. It may be a mystery, but it's the simplest and it's the most consistent with the rest of the teachings of Scripture and God's plan for redemption. So we're coming back to this slide that he, Christ came, he's the second person of the Trinity, and he has two natures. He's fully God and he's fully man. He, he had to be a man, not just because of God's promise in Genesis 3.15, which we'll review, um, but because we needed a kinsman redeemer. That's why I say if, if this is a struggle for you, this concept, totally understand. Um, you know, pa Paul writes to the Corinthians in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Um, <clears throat> he writes in verse 21, For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, there's the Greeks again, right? Super smart, super wise came up with a lot of questions and possible solutions. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles or, or folly to the Greeks. Uh, everybody at this time was wrapped up in the philosophy of, uh, of the Greeks, uh, of, of Greek philosophy, and they said, this is not possible. It is not possible for a god to become man, because the Greeks really thought that the, the body was totally corrupted, it was totally wicked, we need to transcend the body, and that leads into Gnosticism. Okay, And for the Jews... They thought that this, this idea that their God would become a man, this was immoral to them. They wanted something that was totally separate. And so if this is an issue for you, if this is a problem for you, totally understand. Scripture says this is going to be a problem for some people. So my, my suggestion, my solution to this is read all of the Bible. Because God puts the explanations to this in unli the unlikeliest of places. How about that little four-chapter four book in the Old Testament of Ruth? Right? It, it just, it, it, it's their own series, own books to go into all of those, but we get this idea that we need a relative to redeem us. So this whole story points to Christ having two natures, in one person. And, and we're going to go into more of what that means as we go on. Here's a chart about his divine nature and his human nature. Two different natures in the exact same person. God has always existed. So his divine, so his divine nature, Jesus' divine nature, has always existed. There is no beginning. And the arrow to the right goes to infinity. Okay, it, it has no beginning and it has no end. The Bible starts with the words, in the beginning. There was nothing, there was no time. So in the beginning is when time starts, matter starts, space starts, creation starts, God starts everything. He's starting time and time is going to continue, uh, c continue on. Um, God exists outside of that. Now there's going to be time. Now there's going to be a universe. Jesus' human nature has a beginning. His divine nature is eternal, but his human nature begins at conception. Now he's both God and man as he forms in Mary's womb. And he's born, and he lives, he has emotions, he weeps, 
He's hungry and he eats. He's upset he, and he turns over the, he's angry and he turns over the money changers tables through righteous anger. He walks, he breathes, and he died. So his humanness began at conception. He lived and then he died. But what happens next? He's resurrected. And now he still has that same body. He tells this to Thomas. He's resurrected, and yet you can still see the holes in his hand and side from where he was crucified and tortured. So it's a resurrected body, and that body will never die. And this is a picture of what's going to happen to us. We have a beginning. We live, we breathe, we cry, and then we die. But in Christ, we will be risen with new bodies. It's the same body, but it's a new body. And that body will live forever. So Jesus is the picture of what is going to happen to us as the head of our new covenant. All right, back to this slide. So the Christ came. He's the second person of the Trinity. He has two natures, fully God and fully man. And then if you recall... He's the result of a virgin birth. In Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So this is Genesis 3.15. God curses Satan and God curses the woman. And he also gave a blessing that fell on the woman. And then God curses Adam. And that falls on all of creation. There's our principle of headship again. All three of these individuals have a curse, but Adam, Adam's the one who's responsible. Through Adam, the rest of creation is affected. Okay? So it's important here that we take note that the offspring is her offspring. The curse goes through Adam. All creation is cursed through Adam. But Mary conceives through the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's supernatural work circumvents the curse of Adam. And that is why Christ is born sinless. He's born outside of that system. He didn't receive the curse that would have come to him through a human father. Now, I want to shift gears for just a second to set up a conversation that we'll have a little bit later about Mary. Um, we're, we're talking about the God-man. We're talking about somebody who is fully God and fully man, something that we just cannot fully understand outside of eternity, no matter how many of these individual points we think we have nailed down, no matter how many theologians agree, this is a mystery to us. And our tendency is to make it not a mystery. <laughs> and what that ends up leading to is a lot of extra biblical teachings, um, especially involving Mary. And so I want to re-emphasize the point here we are made with hearts and minds and souls bent toward worship, but we are only supposed to worship God. Only God is worthy of our worship. And anything else that we might add to try to nail this down is going to shove God off of his throne. So we've, I've acknowledged to you many times, this is a mystery, it's hard to understand. The Bible tells us it's going to be hard to understand. This is why we need the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So pray for that. Pray for that faith. All right, so Genesis 3.15, God is saying, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between Satan and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Well, both of them get bruised. Yes. Just to comment on a lot of themes that kind of tie together quite nicely and, and timelessly, it's interesting to think back on just how much 
folly and stumbling block over the millennia this aspect of two natures is like when we when we think of how sinful man when they do get drawn to religion lowercase r mm -hmm. right they want it to be this this strong dose of here's what to do right it, it's it's challenging for sinful man to be like wait i have to cast my pride, my sin, my doubt, my guilt, my shame, on the work of this other person. Um, and we see that, like, you, you think of um, how Muslims look at the, their reverence for Muhammad, and then they'll at times extend, well, Christians need to be more offended when, when people portray Christ like this. Well, I'm offended for you guys. We don't allow our religion to be shamed like that. And it's that understand, it's that sinful, wrong, stumbling block of I want it to be this. I want to, ha I want to have to climb the ladder myself mm -hmm, mm -hmm. rather than throwing this out. And it, it's just such a reality of the, the stumbling block of understanding two natures at once the assembling blocks of wait, I not only don't have to, aren't able to, but also don't even get to try. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That yeah, that's the right. So, so the comment was how much of a stumbling block uh, casting all of our sin, all of our guilt and our shame on another person is uh, to other religions, uh, to peoples of other faiths. I'm gonna I'm gonna mention a particular individual in a bit who is this is a true stumbling block for him. Um, yes, absolutely, and we see that in the garden right away. They feel shame, and what do they do? They go to cover themselves, and that is totally that covering is totally worthless. God has to cover them. Very good. So we have these two bruisings predicted. Um, it sounds like both of them get bruised, but the difference is the bruise to the head leads to death. The bruise to the heel can be recovered from. So the bruise that Satan has will be vanquished and the bruise to the heel, yes, Christ will be crucified, he will die, but that's part of the plan. He will come again. In Isaiah 7:14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, behold the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means kids What is it? Thank you, God with us. God is actually with us at this time, walking at, the, at that time, walking on the earth. Jesus, the God-man. So we'll go back to this chart. For as in Adam, 1 Corinthians again, Paul telling us, for as in Adam all die. That's the curse, it's passed on. Our sin nature, remember, is our, can, our won't. We don't want to please God and we actually can't please God. There's nothing we can do, no covering, no work, nothing to make up for that. We can't save ourselves and we won't even try. We want to be the savior. We want to be the savior. I would argue when you have discussions like this with unbelieving friends or maybe even, <laughs> even with yourself, Ask yourself, does that, is, that, is that person trying to save himself? Am I trying to save myself? Anything that approaches that is just not going to cut it. We talked last week about scripture. You know, we're, we're dead. For as in Adam, all die. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. All of our righteousness is as filthy rags. This is counter to the common, very common evangelical idea uh, that all you have to do, you're a drowning swimmer, Christ throws you that life raft, and all you have to do is grab. All you have to do is accept his salvation. But scripture's words are, you are dead. Remember, we even looked at it in the positive way. Even if you don't want to look at it as death, look at it as in the positive way. Jesus tells Nicodemus, you have to be born again. That's a very, being born's a great thing. You can't do it yourself. So you're dead in your trespasses and sins. You can't bring yourself to life. You can't reach out for that life raft. Christ has to bring you back 
to life. Now, here's the point where we are going to talk a little bit about Mary, okay? We're we're not going to go deep into this, but I want to give you just a little bit of thought regarding Mary and the way that she is venerated in the Roman Catholic Church, okay? Um, the, The Roman Catholic Church's position is that one of the reasons that Christ is sinless is because um, he was born of Mary, specifically, and that Mary, therefore, is holy as Christ's mother. And one of the reasons that they give for explaining her holiness is to say that she was born without sin. Now, there are some technicalities there that I would encourage you to look at. But if we generalize for this, for this morning um, that she gave birth to a perfect child because she was born in a similar manner. Now, I think you can probably see some of the issues that we have right away. How far does this go back? How many people were born sinless in this process to make sure that this worked? Okay. But I think the larger problem that we have is that being born sinless was necessary, but it wasn't the only way that Christ had to be sinless. He had to live his life in the way that Adam didn't. He had to live a sinless life. And biblically, it doesn't work for anybody else to be sinless. Why would God wait for Christ if Mary could have done it? Now, I want to give, there, there's, a lot, there's a lot to talk about, to discuss here. I, I want to talk a little bit about why Mary is held in such high esteem. This is something that goes all the way back to the early church and all the way back to the Greeks. I promise, this is the only week we'll talk this much about the Greeks, but they're really important. Um, the Greeks believed in something called hierarchicalism, another big H word. And it's going to make a lot of sense to you because we have this structure in our society today. Think about the president for a second, okay? Can you walk up to the White House and knock on the door and say, hi, I'd like to speak to you, please. I have a problem. You know, there actually was a day when you could do that. You can't do that anymore, okay? No. We've got a system of hierarchies. If you want to talk to the president, you've got to know somebody who knows the president or know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, okay? And the Greeks and Romans had this system, this political system. You couldn't walk up to the emperor, say, hello, excuse me, okay? No, you had to know somebody. You had to have a patron who could take your concern or your question, that person who was higher up on the ladder. And the church almost very quickly takes this into its theology in the form of patron saints, okay? And they get this idea that God is holy, he's separate from us, he is unapproachable as the holy, all-powerful God in their minds. We need someone to take our our, our petitions to him. Pretty reasonable, right? And Who do you want to take your petition to Jesus who's going to get in his brain better than his mom? Perfect sense. Total sense, right? She's got the most sway. Again, read all of Scripture. Picture after picture, time and time again, God is holy. He is magnificent in a way that not even a tiny percent, we can't even understand a tiny percentage, and yet his desire is to be in communion with us. His desire from eternity past is to repair the relationship that we would break. And when Christ dies, that division in the temple between us and the holiest of holies is torn in two. We don't need a priest, we don't need a patron, we don't need a saint. As much logical sense as that might make, we don't need any of those mediators. There's one mediator between God and man. We can talk to him anytime we want, 
and he's God. But as I said, even if Mary, as important a role as she plays in Scripture, was born without sin, she would have had to live her life completely without sin. So Christ came to offer his people, to offer his life. He was born without sin. He lived his human life in perfect obedience in thought, word, and deed, and yet died the death of a condemned sinner. The perfect person had to be born and live perfectly. You know, in the Old Testament, we get this and, you know, have to, have to give a little bit to the secularists and pagans who argue this. There's a lot of blood in the Old Testament. Scholars will sometimes give us the picture of Passover week that blood was just flowing out of the temple through the streets. That, you, that Christ, as he went to the cross, he would have been covered not only in his own blood, but the blood of the lambs that had been killed. There's a lot of blood in the Old Testament sacrificial system. And the, the Jews needed to be, they, they needed to sacrifice again and again and again and again all throughout the Old Testament to emphasize what? Your sin is horrible. It deserves death. We're going to take this spotless lamb. You know, you think about how many people won't eat meat today because animals are just so cute. And they are. And what's required? you got to take that cute lamb that you've cared for, that's spotless, and you have to kill it because your sin is that great. But actually, that's only a picture. It's your death that's required. So Christ was born without sin. He lived in perfect obedience. He had, to be, he had to do what Adam could not do. He had to be the perfect man to pay the penalty for all of us in the church who have sinned all of those sins. And Christ, when he comes, he even clarifies. I thought I was going to have a lot of time today. It turns out I didn't. Sorry, Pastor Nick. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, he comes and he even clarifies what's the extent of our sin. He doesn't let people get away with, oh, I've never murdered anybody. No. Have you thought hateful thoughts? Oh, I've never committed adultery. Have you ever had any lust in your heart? That is the same. That is equal. You are deserving of death and eternal damnation even when you haven't done anything. Because we sin in thought and in word and in deed. So he came, he lived a perfect life, and he died the death of a condemned sinner. He died the most horrible death possible, imagined at that time, for us. And his physical suffering was only part of it. As horrible as we know that death was from historians, he also experienced total separation from his father the withdrawal of communion that he had enjoyed. And he bore God's wrath and curse for all of humanity. For all... I mean, okay, think about it this way. If you had to bear the punishment for all of your life's sins in a one-day span, how awful would that be? But he did it for everybody in his church, for all of his people. He's paying the price for me judging someone else or for me saying an unkind word that they may never know about. He's paying the price for the time that you disobeyed your mom when you were four that you don't even remember. He's paying the price for that in his sacrifice. God's wrath and curse for every sin is on him. And he did this to redeem his people. What is redemption? Have any of you kids ever even been in a pawn shop? I can't remember the last time I was in a pawn shop, but this is kind of the, 
the, the classic example for redemption that you use. You know, you need some money, so you take something that's worth something, and you take it to the pawn shop, and they give you some money, usually not a lot, right? <laughs> they give you some money so that you can go and pay that bill, and they hold it for you. They say, we're not going to sell it to anybody else for a little while, so that if you get some more money, you can come back and you can redeem that possession. So Christ came and paid the price to get us back. He paid the price that we would have been required to pay to restore fellowship between us. That's why scripture says we are not our own. We were bought at a price. We belong to him. That's what it means to be redeemed. We've also got lots of theology words this morning, right? We've got this idea of propitiation. To appease wrath through sacrifice. So Christ paid the price to get us back and actually that, that looks like appeasing all of God's wrath through sacrifice. He took on all of those sins onto himself. But here's where I do want to pause for just another minute and let you kids know, you've grown up in the church. These ideas, even if you don't know all of the words, all of the doctrine, these are ideas that probably make a lot of sense to you because it's what you were taught from the cradle. And praise God for that. But I want you to know that there are people out there in the world for whom the idea that Jesus could pay, could take on God's wrath for you, they actually hate that idea. They think that that is wicked. There's a man who's no longer alive. His name was Christopher Hitchens. He was a very, very popular secularist and atheist, and his writings are still very popular. And he, he's kind of a, a grandfather of a lot of people who don't believe in God today. And this really stuck in his crawl. He thought that this was wicked. That we could ask someone else to take God's wrath for us. He said, how could I ever, he said, I, I might be able to pay your debt, but how could I ever ask you to die for me? That's evil. What Hitchens was discounting was that this was God. He's right. He couldn't pay my debt. He couldn't take God's wrath. But God can. And there again is that proof that we need that the two natures in one person has to be there. We can't escape it. He's got to be a man to pay our price, but just a man can't pay our price. It has to be God. And then our final word, reconciliation, to remove all enmity. He removes the barrier. He, res he restores fellowship. And he makes a space for the Holy Spirit to come and indwell us. Where before you had to go to a temple to commune with God, to pay that penalty, or to, pay that, to, to give that sacrifice, now God's temple is in you. So in Christ, only Christ can be the just and justifier because he's God and man. He's the judge. But he can declare us clean, declare us to be his worthy bride, and bring us back into fellowship and communion with him and make us part of his family. Any questions? Any additional thoughts, comments? Is there enough time for what you had for us, Pastor Hathaway? Yeah. All right. Well, I'll invite him up then. But while I'm getting the mic, and we're talking about Christology, about our, our understanding of Jesus. And so can any of you raise your hands and tell me, tell me 
What's a reason from the scripture to believe that Jesus is God? And you think, ah, this one's a little bit janky. Go ahead. I have some some janky ones that I'm going to put before you. Why do you think Jesus is God? Why do you think the Bible teaches that Jesus is God? Okay. Adults. (laughs) You're on the boardwalk. You're sharing the gospel with somebody. You're at work. And they say, oh, I believe in Jesus. He's not God. Yeah, Grady? John 1. John 1. Yes, this is... If you don't know that one, John 1.1 1, 1 is great. And this is where we go, especially with, with Jehovah's Witnesses. And what they would, Jehovah's Witnesses would say is, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and was the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And Jehovah's Witnesses will say, it says there that He was a God. That's a huge problem, and it's a misunderstanding of that passage. But that's not the only place that we have. Yeah, John, All and then John. The John. All the I am statements in John, Okay. Uh, So I am, when Jesus says, I am, I am the way, the life, the truth, the door. Um, Normal people don't talk in such a hyperbolic sort of way. But of all the I am statements, the one that I would point you to most of all is he said, before Abraham was, I am. And so when someone, when you or I say I am, it's, it's one thing. When Jesus says it to a Jewish crowd, what he's saying is the I am that I am. Yahweh of the Old Testament, that's me. Before Abraham was, I was. No, no. Before Abraham was, I am. He's saying, I am the covenant Lord. John, okay, yeah. Yeah, George. Yes, so what did Jesus talk, how did he refer to himself most often? What did he call himself? Son of man. Well, isn't a boy a son of man? Who has less power and, and, and is impressive than a boy, okay? But son of man uh, is Jesus referencing this very famous passage in Daniel 7. Here it is, Daniel 7, 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days, who was talked about just previously, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Okay, so imagine a king who never falls, and he's a king of kings. He's eternal. All power and authority have been given to him. Who's greater than that? What do we call such a person? A god, okay? But not just a god, a super god, a god of gods, a god over gods. Uh, and so that's why we call him God, synonymous with the Lord. Yeah, John? The baptism of Jesus in Matthew. Yes, the baptism of Jesus in Matthew. This, uh, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Um, so in the ancient world, son, son of just didn't mean something lesser than. It meant of the same substance as. So where, whereas Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses kind of fall off the boat and say, oh, it means he's a son of, he's not the same thing as. No, no, no. When they would say he's the son of, they meant the same substance. Um, yeah. Another one, remember in the, yeah, Jonathan? Sit at my right hand. And, yeah. And that's quoted in the New as proof that Jesus is, is the Lord. Yeah, so this is David speaking. So who's higher than David? Nobody's higher than David. The Lord said to my Lord. So there's a multiplicity of lords over him. Um, And uh, yeah, Jesus forgiving sins. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Um, There's also throughout the, yeah, go ahead, John, John, yeah. There's there's more, and we, yeah. You got one, Matthew? Go ahead. Isaiah 53. What does Isaiah 53 say? It says um, that he is uh, almighty God. The suffering servant is almighty God. Everlasting father. The son is father. That's interesting. There, there's more. Uh, he's called kurios over and over again, which means Lord. You're like, oh, yeah, he's like a master, like other masters. No, no, no. Kurios is what the Septuagint translated Yahweh as. He's claiming to be the Lord God uh, there. Whenever he would give these prophecies, Matthew, did you have one? 
Okay, whenever Jesus would give prophecies, what would he say, thus says the Lord? What would he say? What would Jesus say? I say to you. Verily, verily, I say to you. Okay, so there's lots of fakes and falsehoods and uh, uh, problems out there, Christological heresies, but the way that we really see which is wrong and which is right is by studying the truth, studying, doing what George said to us and studying all that's true. Um, so you see here, Docetism thinks that he's, Jesus is just spirit. He only seemed to be flesh, but we believe him to be spirit and flesh. Modalism, they thought that there was God the Father in the Old Testament, God the Son in the Gospels, God the Spirit in the, the rest of the Testament. They think of those gods as distinct. We think of them as one. Eutychianism, that he's only divine, that his human nature was subsumed into his divinity. He was, he was only God. Uh, but we also say he's human. Uh, Islam thinks that Jesus was pure. They think he had a virgin birth. They think he is so pure he didn't die on the cross, that he was switched out at the last second. But we know that he's also the suffering servant. Jehovah's Witnesses think he's a son of God, but he's God. Remember, everlasting father. Who's that talking about? That's talking about Jesus. Um, Mormonism, they think he's the son, that we can all become gods, that he's a, he's a, he was spirit before, and then he became uh, God through his perfect life, and that we can do that too. But we see from Isaiah, he's, he's the father as well. They, they, they prioritize that son-father relationship and take it to an extreme. They do theology, minus mystery equals heresy. Um, liberalism, they teach that Jesus is the, the great teacher. Oh, revere his teachings. You see how he taught us to live. But he had to die for us. It's not just that easy. Um, one, one other, you've got some homework I'm going to get to in just a second. But other, another homework is to go through the Christology of Hebrews. Study what Hebrews says. He's greater than angels. He's greater than Moses, greater than Aaron, greater than all the other sacrifices. Uh, so this will help you understand what's true. So here is your uh, homework, Read Confessing Christ, chapter 3, and the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapters 14 and 15. And those, those, are, those are short. Let's pray.